This is Access Tech Live. And welcome back to Access Tech Live. Now, Mark, the opening ceremonies are tomorrow and all eyes are on Paris 2024. The work, however, begun a long time ago to make sure that the athletes and spectators have an amazing experience, accessibility, of course, included. Now, one company that leads that charge is Intel. And joining us now is uh, Daryl Adams, Intel's Director of Accessibility. Welcome back to uh, Access Tech Live, Daryl. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. And uh, Todd Harple is also here, Intel's Olympics AI Innovation Program Lead. Uh, Todd's joining us from Paris. Uh, and a bit of a dodgy connection there, Todd, but hopefully you can remain with us. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people using the internet right now. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm actually in an employee break zone inside the Stade de France right now because while the, the opening ceremonies don't happen for a few days, Rugby Sevens have happened. They've started... <laughs> so much fun. Um, Dara, let's start with you for a second here. Talk to us about some of the innovation that you've been demonstrating about what I would think is a simple task, navigating the various, of course, sights and sound of Paris. Yeah, I think maybe it's, it's good to start with a little bit of history here. I think um, a little bit before the pandemic, uh, we were doing some research at Intel with uh, looking at Intel employees with disabilities and the types of barriers that our employees actually face within our own workplace. And so we were specifically looking at employees who were blind or low vision. And after all of this research, we realized that the common trend was the biggest challenge they had was actually navigating our campuses and being able to get from their desk area to the, to the cafeteria and, or to a meeting space, these kinds of things. And so the goal was to take Intel technology that we develop in our labs and try to apply those technologies directly to solve or reduce the barriers that our employees face. And if we could then be successful in that, we'd want to then go uh, forward and see how we can maybe add that type of capability into our products as well. And so if we fast forward to today, we began looking at or, or so we, we've extended this, this idea around indoor wayfinding. The, the trouble being that wayfinding is a, is a ubiquitous tool outside. GPS is everywhere, but GPS signals don't work inside. So we have to figure out how to solve for that and give that same type of experience, but indoors. And the way that we've approached this is looking at a solution where you use a LIDAR scanner and you basically scan the indoor uh, space entirely. The value that this brings is it brings this ability to create depth and distance information, which is critical for, for the wayfinding experience. Then the actual user experience involves using a, a, a mobile phone camera to orient you in space, and then you select the destination, and the phone will route you directly to your destination with turn-by-turn -turn directions. Daryl, what has the feedback been from users who have been using it? It's, it's really good. I think that probably the, and maybe I should also note that I myself am, um, I have retinitis pigmentosa, so I'm losing my eyesight from the outside in. And I have a sliver of vision, but I certainly rely on orientation, mobility, training, white cane. And the thing that I recognize most is that the, the challenges that I, that I encounter is really around being confident in my travel and knowing where I'm going and knowing that I have actually got to the destination that I think I'm supposed to be at. And this is where this application is really useful because it gives the ability to preview your route. So before you get somewhere, you can understand a little bit more about where you're going. And then once you're there, you can have that confidence because the app will tell you exactly where you are at any given point. So that uh, has just been really useful. And if I Kind of extrapolate that to the athlete experience. We, we've the, the Team USA uh, uh, High Performance Training Center in Paris has been mapped, and so the idea is that as the Paralympic athletes come to the facility, they're they're really at the top of their game. They're, they're, this is days before their events. They need to be there. They're fully they're at the peak fitness. They need to be now 100% focused and on, on the job at hand, and that's winning medals. And so we want to make sure that we're eliminating as much of the distraction and all of that kind of cognitive load that comes with trying to learn a new place. And so we're really hoping that 
that technology like this can really just help those athletes understand or, or kind of lessen the burden that they have as they are completely just navigating this whole entirely new space. Uh, Todd, let me bring you in on this because this is really interesting. Of course, we often think when we, we think about these events, we think about the people, we think about the effort, we think about the sports themselves and the humans behind them. You're involved and your role is AI. So how does that help in, in making people enjoy the games? And uh, the claim, of course, that this will be the most accessible games yet. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because there there is a crossover here between the things that Daryl's telling you about and the things that we at Intel have brought to the game since the beginning of our sponsorship in 2017. Um, I'll get to the video you were showing earlier that actually relates to one of the things, things we're doing. But uh, the navigation that he's talking about, we've also thought of other ways to help athletes, for instance, using AI um, with a chatbot. So these athletes turn up at these games and they're faced with hundreds of pages of new information, you know, whether it's from their international federation or from their Olympic committee or from the IOC. They have offers from sponsors and so forth, and they can't navigate it all, and there's no single point of contact. Well, now we've managed to do it in a secure, safe way by making um, a chatbot. You know, a chatbot sounds simple, but it gets more complicated when you have to think about how do I ensure that the information is accurate and up to date. And so we've developed a system using what's called a RAG pipeline, which makes it that it only looks in one spot for the answers. So our, our athletes can ask the question in any of six languages and get an answer across all of this body of information. So that's one way we've improved the accessibility for athletes in the village. And like Daryl was saying, it also reduces the cognitive load because they're here, it's a different environment, they're focused on performance and any distraction can take them away from that. So that's one, but we have ways that we're using AI to support fans, organizers, and athletes. And it's cool, I mean, what would you wanna hear about? I, I can tell you about any of these wonderful things that we've brought to the games. Well, uh, we could talk about all of it, and I want to hear all of it, uh, but I wanna pick up on something mm -hmm. you just mentioned there, and that's language. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we've often yes. heard, it, it, when all of this new technology comes along, Language is often used as a way of showing how we can break down barriers. And this, of course, is a great way and a great place to do that. Exactly. I mean, the official languages of the Olympics are French and English. But, of course, there's a lot of uh, folks who come here who don't speak French or English. And so we also offered in Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. So that covers an overwhelming majority of people in the world can speak or at least uh, have some competency in any of these languages. And so it makes it so much easier. And even, you know, some of the tools we're using, I'm working here outside the Stade de France, and, you know, it really points out to you how difficult it is to communicate because the majority of people are not multilingual. I want and to bring both of you in here, and Daryl, feel free to... It. Feel free to chime in as well. Um, you know, a, you've been planning for this obviously for quite some time, right? You talk about things about chatbots. You know, people weren't really talking about chatbots even even two years ago. What are the biggest challenges when you when you try to tackle something like this head on? And how receptive has the Olympic Committee been in terms of adopting a lot of these tools and presenting them to not only the athletes but even the fans? Yeah. Well, for the chatbots. Um, it's very interesting because I spent uh, quite a bit of time embedded at the International Olympic Committee understanding their challenges. And this challenge came explicitly from the head of the athlete relations department. And they were saying these athletes are under so much pressure and we have difficulty getting accurate and correct information. So we started out thinking about the leaders of the athletes groups called chef de mission. And so basically those people need to be armed with all of the correct information um to feed to their teams and in the past they didn't have all the right information they might not have had the most updated information but now we can ensure everybody has up-to-date and accurate information because we control what gets updated and when and become a single point of contact and, and i would Donald, add that Donald, uh, yeah carry on, uh, i just quick, quickly add that the 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 idea of a conversational interface with technology is also a really a positive step forward for accessibility for many people, not for all, but just the idea that you can speak and 
to, to the technology and have it have the response being spoken back to you is just a, a much more natural human interaction, I think, that works well for many people. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about the fans themselves then, because you know they're going to be able to enjoy this in a new way, right? Using all of this technology. So, what does that what does that look like for fans? We've got a number of things going on. One of the things I'm most excited about is why I'm here at the stadium today. So, it relates to technology we've developed called 3D athlete tracking, and using actual Olympians, we've trained the systems so that they can understand what elite biomechanical uh, motion looks like. And because of this, we're able to create a system where I can put people through six or seven different exercises, very simple ones, and then use those to assess what sport they might be best at. And here's some examples of how we're tracking. These track like 21 different spots on the human body. And because we have insight from professional athletes, we know what it looks like from an elite perspective. And so we've been having people go through this experience here outside the stadium um, we have a, a whole, whole uh, lab set up where they can walk through, get this, and at the end be told, hey, this is the sport that might be best for you, sport climbing, basketball, et cetera. And it's been really exciting that the fans love it because they're able to see what they might be good at. And we had a fun story where um, this young man came through, um, and we went through it twice with him because he was excited. He was an influencer, I was told. And we came out, and he got sport climbing twice. And I turned to him and I said, wow, have you ever tried sport climbing? And he said, I am a sport climber. I just missed the Olympic team. Oh, oh wow. Um, <laughs> Donald so Todd, uh, we're going to take a quick break. Don't go anywhere. I want to come back. Uh, I know that you have uh, limited time, but uh, so much more to talk about. There's the broadcasting side of things. There's the fact that you're tracking people without having to put big suits on them and stuff like that. There's so many things to talk about. Stick around. This is Access Tech Live. We'll come back and talk more about uh, maybe the opening ceremonies tomorrow. Stick around. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back.